So America is the richest democracy with the worst poverty. That's who America is. Uh, there's no other advanced industrial society that has the kind of poverty that we have and the level of poverty that we have, and that's always troubled me. And so I wanted to understand the role that housing plays in that story. And I thought that looking at people getting evicted, looking at families forcibly, physically removed from their homes, was a decent way of going about that. So I started this work the old-fashioned way. I moved into a trailer park on the far south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Has anyone been to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the room? Oh, hey, what's up? Hello. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Hello. Okay, you guys keep me honest. Uh, for the rest of you, Milwaukee's a city in America. It's in the middle of the country. It's our 30th biggest city. And I rented a trailer in this trailer park and I lived there for five months. And then I moved into a room on the north side of Milwaukee. That's Milwaukee's inner city. And I lived there for about 10 months. And from those two neighborhoods, I followed families getting evicted. I went everywhere with those families. I went to eviction court with them. I followed them into abandoned homes and shelters. I ate from their table. I watched their kids. I went to work with them, church AA meetings with them. Uh, went to several funerals and was even there for a birth. Like there for a birth? Have you ever been to a birth? It's intense. It's intense, right? Yeah. I know. <laughs> don't. Don't do it. Um, but I knew to really understand how the low-income housing market worked, I needed to get just as close with landlords doing the evicting as I did with tenants who were getting evicted. So I did. So I went to eviction court with landlords too, and I helped them pass out eviction notices and collect their uh, rents and fix up their properties. And I understand now what makes them tick and what ticks them off. And I try to write a book about this incredibly complicated and fraught relationship, but one that's essential if we want to understand inequality in America today, the relationship between landlords and tenants. So I was going about this work and there are all these questions that kept springing to mind, like how many people get evicted? Who gets evicted? What are the long-term consequences of getting tossed from your home? And I went looking for answers to those questions, just came up empty. And um, so I decided to collect some of this big data myself. So one thing that I did is design a survey where we talked to about uh, 1,900 tenants all over the city of Milwaukee. We sent interviewers to some of the most affluent neighborhoods in the city, those those blue dots, and some of the most troubled neighborhoods in the city, those those red dots. I had an interviewer uh, mugged, one was bit by a dog. It's actually the same guy, actually, same interviewer, <laughs> Steve. Um, he needs to work on his situational awareness, really. Yeah. <laughs> But we worked really hard for these data, and what we were learning were things that we didn't know before about eviction and involuntary removal and housing cost burden in the lives of low-income families. Didn't stop there, though. Analyzed hundreds of thousands of eviction records. These are records that are processed through civil court in America. Talked to 250 people right after they got evicted because we wanted to figure out, like, when do you get evicted but you don't, even though you owe your landlord the same amount of money? And we try to put all that kind of bigger data or that statistical data into a conversation with my field notes, my notebooks, the things that I was learning every day on the ground in Milwaukee, living alongside tenants and working alongside landlords. And Evicted is really a book in that spirit. It starts on the ground and ends on the ground. It follows eight families through the process of eviction. Uh, some are white, some are black, some have kids, some don't. And so in that spirit, I wanted to take our time with you today to, uh, to tell you one person's story, and that's Arlene's story. And so Arlene had a 14-year-old son, Jory, and one day he and his cousin were like cutting up, throwing snowballs at passing cars, and Jory packed this like really tight snowball and hurled it at this car and smacked this car. And the car jerked to a stop, and this man jumped out. And so Jordan and his cousin like ran inside, and they locked the door. And the man followed them there, and he kicked the door down, just busted the door in. And thank God he left before anything else happened. But when Arlene's landlord found out about that, she decided to evict Arlene and her boys for damaging property. Just a quick note about eviction in America. Eviction in America is very quick. It takes place through the legal system. It takes about 30 days uh, to evict someone in the city of Milwaukee and most other places. And landlords don't even need a reason. But this landlord had a reason, which was property damage. So Arlene took her two sons, Jory and Jafaris, Jafaris was six, to the Salvation Army Homeless Shelter, which a lot of folks in Milwaukee just call the lodge. So you can tell your kids, we're staying at the lodge tonight, like it's a hotel. And from there, they were on the hunt for another place to live. And they found this place, which was on 19th Street. But there was often no water, and Jory had to bucket out what was in the toilet. But Arlene told me, you know, it was $525 for a whole house, and it was quiet. 
When we looked at that survey data that we collected, one thing that we found is that folks who get evicted move into much worse housing than they lived in before. So if we want to know why some kids have to live with like lead paint, exposed wires, no heat, no water in cities like Milwaukee, one reason is their families are forced to accept these kinds of conditions in the harried aftermath of an eviction. So the city of Milwaukee eventually found this place unfit for human habitation, and folks boarded up the windows and the doors, and Arlene and her boys were on the hunt for another place to live. So she told Jory, like, we take whatever we could get, which is what moving looks like when you're in that kind of position, just taking whatever you could get. And what Arlene could get was this drab apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue. But she soon learned it was a haven for drug dealers. In fact, the whole block was drug-soaked and hot. And she feared for her boys, especially for Jory, who was like um, goofy and had this beautiful smile and would talk to anyone. So in Arlene's case, why she moved, the fact that she was forced out of this place, was pretty important for understanding why she ended up in such a rough neighborhood. And we tested that statistically, and we found that, you know, we can control for a lot of different things. And you still see families who get evicted move from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones, move from neighborhoods with high levels of crime to even more dangerous blocks. So eviction seems to push families deeper into disadvantage. So Arlene moved out of Atkinson as fast as she could. She found this two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on 13th Street in Keefe, right in the middle of inner city Milwaukee. There was a big old hole in the living room window. Uh, the carpet was just like filthy and ground in. Um, there was no lock on the door, so Arlene learned to lock it with like a plank. She slid into brackets. But she put on a good face, you know. She hung up curtains and she took a piece of cloth and she stuffed in that hole in the window. So the rent for this kind of place, which is located in a very poor neighborhood in Milwaukee, which is our fourth poorest city in America, the rent was $550 a month, utilities not included, and that took 88% of Arlene's welfare check. And she knew that some months she would have to sell her food stamps to make rent, and her and her boys would try to get by on these things we call oodles and noodles. Um, when you're spending over 80% of your income on rent, there's no extra money for anything, like clothes for jewelry or toys for Jafaris. Jafaris had this like amazing ability to transform like a bucket or a mop handle or whatever he could get his hands on into soldiers and tanks, you know, like engaged in warfare. So here's the situation in America. Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing costs. For about a century, there's been this consensus in the United States that we should spend 30% of our income on rent. That gives us enough money to save, afford enough food, transportation. And for a long part of our history, many renters met that goal. But times have changed. So this is a graph that shows the percentage of poor renting Americans spending 30% of their income on housing costs or less, that's that blue line, or 50% or more of their income on housing costs, that's that orange line. And you'll see that percentage of poor renting families hitting our standard of affordability has just declined over the last two, two decades. But the percent who is incredibly rent burdened has gone up and up and up to the point that today, the majority of poor renting American families spend at least 50% of their income on housing. And about one in four of those families spend over 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. Just like imagine that for a second, just like 70% of your income is like gone at the beginning of the month if you want a roof over your head and hot water. Under these conditions, you don't need to like make a huge mistake or have a big emergency wash over your life to get evicted. Something as innocent as a snowball can do it. So for families like Arlene's, eviction is much more the result of inevitability than irresponsibility. So how do we get here? So for the past two decades, really for the past four, incomes of Americans of modest means haven't moved a lot. So if you are in a home headed by someone without a high school or without a college education, you've seen your income basically flatline over the last two decades. In some areas of the country, it's fallen in real terms. But as that has happened, housing costs have soared. So between 1995 and today, Median rent has increased by over 70% in America, adjusting for inflation. So you have this closing gap between what low-income families are bringing in and what they have to pay for just basic shelter needs. But then we might say, wait a minute here, where's public housing or social housing? Where's the government in this story? And the answer is, we have some of that in America, but that's for the lucky minority of poor renting families. 
So today, only about 6% of poor renting families live in public housing in America. An additional 19% receive some other kind of help from the government, usually in the form of a voucher that reduces their rent burden. But the vast majority, the unlucky majority, receive, um, it's a technical term, nothing. Zippo, nada, from state, local, or federal governments. Not because they can't like meet a level of qualifications, but we just don't have enough to go around, which would be a situation that would be kind of unthinkable when it comes to meeting other basic human needs. Imagine if we turned away three and four families who applied for help with food, for example, saying, I'm sorry, we don't have enough for you, you have to go hungry. But that's exactly how we treat low-income Americans searching for affordable shelter today. Arlene gave up that search like a long time ago, but one day, just like on a whim, she stopped by the housing authority and she asked about the list. And she was told by the person behind the counter, like, the list is frozen because on it were 3,500 families who had applied for rent assistance five years ago, which is not bad at all. Like the waiting list for public housing in some of our biggest cities now is not counted in years, it's counted in decades. So I have two young children now. If I applied for public housing today in Washington, D.C., I would probably be a grandfather by the time my application just came up for review. So if Arlene wanted public housing or social housing, this is what she'd have to do. She'd have to wait like four or five years till just the list unfroze, till she was able to put her name on the list. Then she'd have to wait another five or six years till her name made it to the top of the pile. And then she would just have to like um, pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore all the evictions she's collected while trying to make ends meet unassisted in the private market. When we picture the typical low-income American family today, we shouldn't think of them living in public housing or getting any kind of help from the government. We should think of someone like Arlene, because she's our typical case. So on 13th Street, Arlene found like this bucket of paint and brushes in the basement and she gave the walls a fresh coat. But not long after moving in, her sister died and she pitched in for the funeral. She didn't have the money, but like no one else did either. You know, she gave out of love. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because a letter announcing the appointment was mailed to 19th Street or maybe Atkinson Avenue. So the caseworker sanctioned Arlene's check. She basically cut the check. So Arlene's $628 a month check was reduced or slashed. And when that happened, she fell two months behind in rent and she got the pink papers, as we call them in America, the eviction summons and complaint. So Milwaukee is a city of about 105,000 renter homes. Every year in Milwaukee, landlords evict 16,000 people. That's a f about 40 people a day evicted in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We've now crunched the numbers in Cleveland, Chicago, Kansas City, New York City, see 60 martial evictions every single day. I can now tell you, because we launched this giant database of evictions in America recently, that these rates in Milwaukee, which are scary and terrible, are not even at the top of the pack in the American scene. But these numbers count only formal court-ordered evictions. These are evictions that are processed through the court system, but there are other ways, cheaper and quicker ways, for a landlord to get you out. So Joe Parazinski, he was this landlord in the middle of Milwaukee, a building manager in the middle of Milwaukee, and he told me for every eviction that he does that goes to the court, there are like 10 that don't. So what he would do is he'd be like, look, Tracy, I need that rent. And um, I'll tell you what, if you're out by Sunday, I'll let you use my van, I'll give you 200 bucks. So if you gotta get evicted, that's a pretty good eviction from an American perspective. I met another landlord who will just take your door off if you're behind in rent. So there are a lot of ways to capture all those, you know, to carry out these kind of informal evictions that never go through the court's room. And if you count those, which we did during that survey, and you add those up with all the, in, the formal evictions that are legally processed, and if you count things like building condemnations, like what happened to Arlene's place on 19th Street, and landlord foreclosures, like when the bank takes the landlord's home away, if you add all that up, you learn that every two years in Milwaukee, one in eight renters is evicted. Not one in eight like people in deep poverty or one in eight single moms, just one in eight renters. 
And for a long time, poverty researchers and journalists, we've written sentences like this. Low-income families exhibit high rates of residential instability, period. And we haven't said why. And what we're learning is that low-income families are moving so much just because they're forced to. This is a problem that affects the young and the old, the sick and the able-bodied. But the face of our eviction epidemic, anyways, is just moms with kids. It's just moms with kids. If you go into any urban housing court in America, you just see like a ton of kids running around. In fact, until recently, the South Bronx Housing Court, which is in New York City, literally had a daycare inside of it. It was a South Bronx Housing Court daycare because there are so many children coming through its doors. And low-income African-American women, and moms in particular, like Arlene, are evicted at incredibly high rates. So among black women renters in Milwaukee, one in five reports being evicted sometime in her life, compared to one in 15 white women. And when I crunched that statistic, that was troubling. That was disturbing. Because it meant, for me anyways, that eviction is something like the feminine equivalent to incarceration in America. We know that many of our young, poor African American men are being swept up by the long arm of the criminal justice system. They're being locked up or imprisoned. But many low income African American women are being locked out. And they are disproportionately bearing the brunt of the eviction crisis. That's also not just a crisis that's in our African-American communities. It's our poor white communities, which I write a lot about in my book. It's in our immigrant communities. It's in our expensive cities on the coasts, and it's in our cheap cities in the south and the middle of the country. Today, one in five of all American renters now spends over half of their income on housing costs. This is a huge widespread problem. So um, Arlene went to eviction court. And as is court custom in Milwaukee, she was allowed to stay two extra days in her home for each of her two children. And those days came and went, and she was ordered to be out on a day in early January. So my Milwaukee people will tell you, January is very cold in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this was a very cold winter. The weathermen had been working themselves up, saying that the temperature can drop below 40 degrees uh, with a wind chill. But if Arlene waited any longer, the sheriff would come and they would arrive with a gun and a judge's order and a team of movers. And they would have piled everything just on the sidewalk. And they take everything, like the meat cuts in the freezer, the shower curtain, silk plants, Jafar's asthma machine. So Arlene struck out into the cold and she and Jory loaded this like moving truck that a friend of the family had rented for them. <laughs> And I just got to tell y'all, it was freezing. It was like that kind of cold that burns you. Arlene didn't know where she and the boys would sleep that night. She had tried the lodge and other shelters, but they were full as usual. So she focused on taking what she could to a storage unit that she had sold half of her food stamps and a space heater uh, to rent. So Arlene finally found a room in a uh, domestic violence shelter, like 30 minutes away from Milwaukee. She just told them she was in an abusive relationship to get a roof over her and her boys' heads. And she was once again on the hunt for another place to live. So she called on or applied to uh, 20 apartments, and then 40, and then uh, 60, and then 80. I counted. She was accepted to none of them. You know, even in the inner city, many were out of reach, couldn't afford them. And the place she could afford if she basically tossed everything she had at the rent, weren't calling back either. And part of the problem besides her poverty was her eviction record. This is what it looks like in, uh, this is what an eviction looks like in America. The evictions are public. They're published usually by cities for anyone to see. It's just like a website. And they show how much a landlord claims you owe and the judgment for your eviction and the date of your eviction. And this is a big deal from a landlord's perspective. This kind of signals risk. Many of the landlords I spent time with said they won't take anyone with an eviction within the last two or three years. So this is the big reason why a lot of landlords weren't calling Arlene back, because she was blemished or marked. So finally, the 90th landlord, Mr. 90, said yes. He had a one-bedroom apartment. It was $525 a month. 
Arlene didn't kind of consider what the place looked like, what the neighborhood was like. She told Jory, like, a house is a house. So two months after their eviction court hearing, they moved in. And Arlene liked it. Like, all the lights worked. All the cabinets had fixtures or handles. And when she and the boys had unloaded a lot of the stuff, she just found, like, this trash bag full of, like, towels or clothes or something. And she just lay down against it. And uh, Jafaris came over, and he, like, snuggled into her lap. And Jory came and sat down and, like, pitched his head into his mom's shoulder. And they just, like, stayed like that for a long time. So Arlene got her stuff out of storage. She hung pictures on the wall. She liked things neat, so she hung a little sign over the sink to Jory that said, if you don't clean up after yourself, uh, we're going to have problems. Do you guys remember what it's like to be 14 years old? It's sucky and brutal. And Jory is 14 and is experiencing these long stretches of homelessness. Between 7th and 8th grades, Jory went to five different schools because of his housing instability. And at his new school, he started acting out a bit. And when one day a teacher yelled at him, and uh, he got he, really embarrassed and angry, and he, he kicked her, kicked her in the shin, and he ran home. And the teacher called the principal, but then she thought it was appropriate to call the police. And when officers arrived at the home and the landlord found out about that visit, he told Arlene she had to go. It's kids, you know? Kids are a big part of the story. They can prolong the time you're homeless after your eviction. And they sometimes are the reason you get evicted. In fact, when we looked in the survey that we did in the housing court, when we were trying to figure out why do you get evicted but you don't, even though you owe your landlord the same amount of money, we found that it wasn't your gender, it wasn't your race, it wasn't even how much you owed your landlord with kids. The chance of you getting evicted triple all else equal if you live with kids. And what you're seeing in that finding is landlord discretion. You're seeing a bunch of landlords saying, I'll work with you, but not with you. Because kids cause landlords headache. They like f flush toys down the toilet and they use like the curtains for superhero capes. They cause some dude whose car just been smacked with a snowball to kick your door down. So after that eviction, Arlene started to unravel a little bit. She told me, it's like I got a curse on me. It won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I find my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body's trying to shut down. I recently published a study that showed that mothers who get evicted experience higher rates of depression about two years later. It sticks with you. And between 2005 and 2010, years where housing costs were soaring across America, something else was going up too, and those were suicides attributed to eviction, foreclosure. They doubled during that five-year time span. Arlene told me, just my soul is messed up. I wish my life were different. I wish that when I be an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids and they be grown and they, you know, become something, something more than me. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. The home is the uh, center of life. It's your refuge from work, the pressures of the street. We say that at home we're ourselves, everywhere else we're like someone else. At home we remove our masks. In languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just shelter, but like warmth, family, community, the womb. In um, ancient Egypt, the hieroglyph for home was the same one for mother. 
So eviction causes loss. Families lose not only their home, kids lose their school, you lose your community, you often lose your stuff, which are either taken by movers or piled on the sidewalk to be scavenged by neighbors. It takes a good amount of time and money to build up a home and eviction can just like delete that. An eviction comes with this mark or this blemish, which can prevent you from moving into a good neighborhood and a good house, but can also prevent you from moving into public housing. Because the folks that run our public housing units count eviction as a mark against your application, which means we're systematically denying help to families that need it the most. So we push those families into slum housing, and we push those families into dangerous neighborhoods. We have a study that shows that eviction causes job loss. And I don't know if any of you all in this room have been evicted, but if you have, uh, you know why. It's such a consuming, stressful event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market, and then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul, or your mental health. And I think when we add all that up, we have to conclude that evictions, which used to be rare in America, which used to draw crowds, they're not just a condition of poverty, they're a cause of poverty too, and they're leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation, which means we can't fix poverty in America without fixing housing. So how do we fix it? This is kind of like an embarrassing question for this room, but I'm just gonna press on. So imagine if every family in America had a decent, affordable place to live. If Arlene didn't have to pay 80% of her income to rent, she could keep her kids fed and clothed and off the streets. We know from previous research that when families finally receive a housing voucher after years and years and years on the waiting list, when they finally receive this little ticket that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on rent, instead of 60 or 70 or 80, they do one consistent thing with their freed up money. They take it to the grocery store. They buy more food and their kids become stronger and less anemic. They work for the lucky majority of American families that benefit from them today. But the vast majority of our families aren't so lucky and their kids with names like Jory and Jafaris aren't getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. And like, if we can't afford the freedoms our countries offer us without a roof over our head, then shouldn't access to a decent, affordable home be part of what it means to be an American? My country has defended the rights of uh, the aged population, has uh, defended uh, 12 years of education, basic nutrition, have established these things as rights in America, because we've made this argument that those things are fundamental to human flourishing and economic vitality. Like, show me an argument that housing isn't fundamental to those things, too. I think housing should be a right in America, and the reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So if that's the case, then the question becomes, okay, like, how do we deliver on that obligation? And I think here, there's actually a lot of good news coming from the other side of the pond. Like, just a few generations ago, there were slums in our cities. There are outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia when some of us were still alive. Babies were dying of tuberculosis. America took on a battle with the slum, and we won. We won. And I'll be the first to admit, and I think the book is clear on this, that we still have a long way to go. Like, when I lived in the trailer park, I didn't have any hot water. And I told the landlord, like, hey, I'm a writer, and I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. So can I get some hot water up in here? So I, I get it. But there's no denying that we haven't made huge steps forward in the right direction when it comes to the quality of housing folks are living in today. I just think that's, for American audiences, is important to stress, because we have a narrative that says, you can throw all this money at the problem and nothing ever works. And we fought the war on poverty and poverty won, and that's just empirically false. I also just take a lot of heart that there are organizations all around America just putting in work, driving down family homelessness, fighting off evictions. And so one thing that my family's done with proceeds from this book is to amplify their efforts. So all readers can go to this website, it's called justshelter.org. They can click on their state and they can figure out who's like doing the good work in their own communities and get plugged in with their time or their money. What's the bigger picture? A problem as big as the affordable housing crisis calls for a big solution. We're bleeding out. So one idea would be to take a program that we have that works pretty darn well, the affordable housing voucher program, and expand it to every American below the poverty line. The idea is very simple. If you qualified for this program, you'd actually benefit from the program. 
and you get a ticket and you could take that ticket and you can move into the private housing market and you can live anywhere you wanted as long as your housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy. Instead of paying 60, 70% of your income on rent, you would pay 30% and the voucher would cover the rest. That would fundamentally change the face of poverty in America. That would drive down evictions and make, your, you know, make family homelessness rare again. Families would perceive that, that you feel when you're paying you know, 30% of your income on housing, not 60, 70, or 80. So in America, when I propose this, I usually get two questions. One, would that be a disincentive to work? There's a lot of research on that question. Most of the research says no. Families who receive a housing voucher don't have any effect on their labor market participation. And the truth is the status quo is a much bigger problem uh, to self-sufficiency and economic vitality and work than any affordable housing program can be. Families that are crushed by the high cost of housing can't afford job training or community college classes so they can get plugged into a better place in the labor market. Many can't afford to stay in one place long enough just to hold their job down. And think about like the brain power and creativity and human potential that we just squander because we asked someone like Arlene to spend so much of hers trying to figure out how she's going to make a rent from one month to the next. Poverty reduces people born for better things. Arlene didn't want some small life. She didn't want to eke out an existence and game the system. She wanted to work and thrive and contribute. And a stable, affordable home would have given her a shot at realizing her full potential. So the second question I get is, uh, a universal voucher program sounds kind of expensive. Can we afford it? It's totally expensive. America could totally afford it. So the Bipartisan Policy Center crunched the numbers a few years ago, and they suggested that the kind of thing that I'm suggesting tonight would cost American federal budget about $22 billion more every year. $22 billion more. $22 billion is not a small figure, but it's well within our capacity. America has the funding. We've just made decisions about how to spend it. So every year in my country, and I think in yours too, Homeowner tax subsidies like the mortgage interest deduction far, far, far outpaced direct housing assistance to the needy. In America, we already have a universal housing program. It's an entitlement program. It's just not for poor people. So the year that Arlene got evicted from 13th Street, we as a nation, America, spent about $41 billion to help families like hers through housing programs, public housing, housing voucher programs, $41 billion. That same year, we spent $171 billion on homeowner tax subsidies, which was equivalent to the entire budgets of the Departments of Education, Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, Justice, and Agriculture combined. That's a rather large number. Most of that, family, most of that uh, benefit went to families with six-figure incomes, because if you have more income, you can buy a bigger house and get a bigger deduction. Most white Americans own their home and like are eligible for one of the sweetest cutouts in the tax code. Most black and Latino Americans, because of our history of racial discrimination, don't and are left out of this bargain. It's hard to imagine a social policy that does a better job of amplifying American racial or economic inequality than our current housing policy does. So if we're going like, to spend the bulk of our public dollars on the rich, at least when it comes to housing, I just feel like we should be honest about that. We should just own up to that. We should be like, yes, we like it like this. This is our social contract. I want to live in a country like this instead of repeating this canard that the richest country on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. Okay, so that's one idea. I know you guys have a lot too. And um, I think that in America, one city has to build, one has to destroy. The housing crisis here and on many shores can be settled in a lot of different ways and probably should be. But I think that one thing is certain, like this degree of inequality and this um, like blunting of human potential and this cold denial of just a basic human need um, by no value is this situation justified. There's no ethical code, there's no piece of scripture, there's no holy teaching uh, that can be summoned to defend what we've allowed my country to become. So, thank you so much.